2012 was the year. Arguably this man's finest hour. He spent 11 years at Chelsea Football Club. He won two Premier League titles, four FA Cups, two League Cups, throw in the Champions League in 2012. The Europa League, 12 months later, it is the one and only... Mikel John Obi. Mikel, good evening, my friend. Good evening. Great Thanks for having me. Great to have you. <laughs> does that bring a few memories back listening to that clip, Mikel? Oh, it does. It does. I mean, the biggest night in our history. I mean, what a night. And you what played every minute of I that I played match. every minute. I mean, like the Chelsea fans say, that is my finest game, like you just said. <laughs> Was it? Do you see it, though, Mikel, as your finest game? I do see it. I mean, I think going through the game, every minute that goes past, I was like, wow, I'm having an amazing game here. But then I thought, do you realize that, you know that when you're yeah, in the moment? Yeah, of course, yeah. When at the moment you you kind of know when you <laughs> play really well. Wrong, yeah. <laughs> you put wrong. <laughs> you kind of know when you do really well and when you're not. And when the coach keeps giving you the thumbs up, you're like, okay, that's it. I'm doing really well. So it was an amazing game, and I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna might as well just nick the man of the match here, and then. <laughs> Yes. Did you drug by then just caught that goal? It was like, indeed, oh, he did. Just okay. nicked it from me. Do you remember specifically, Mikel, that night? Because we, we reminisce about that night yeah. quite a lot on the show. Let's be frank, Chelsea were a little lucky. <laughs> Bayern Munich dominated. Hey, but that's they did. football. They it's did, football. Yeah, they did. It's they more did. than 90 minutes. Yeah. Drogba scores the header. Yeah. In the moment, was there any part of you that was panicking, thinking that this game's getting away from us? Or always is the Chelsea mantra. We're still in this game. We're still in this game. We've of got course, a chance. of course. Yeah, every. I think it was the second half. We started thinking, oh, I think we're gonna lose it here, because, like you said, they dominated the game. They played really well by Munich, and they hit the woodwork. I think two or three times. Yeah. yeah. Penalty. They missed the penalty, and we we're thinking, wow, this is it. Because before the game, we spoke about it. We we're like, you know, this is the last chance because we had the likes of John Terry, Frank Lampard, Drogba, Peter mm. Cech. It was their last Champions League. If we didn't win it, that was it. But then we kept going. We were like, you know what? Even when this scored, we were like, oh, wow, I we think we're going to nick a goal here. And then that corner kick just came and then the big man just put it, you he know, nuts it in and then went to the penalty. We were like, okay, that's it. We are definitely winning this game. You and felt also, that. The, yeah. the, when you got through against Barcelona in the semi finals, I watched that game from start to finish. One of the most extraordinary games to watch yeah. from a neutral perspective. Barcelona were, were basically, they, they pitched a tent inside the Chelsea <laughs> penalty area for the entire match. Thanks and to John it, Terry. It was, it was a 2 10 2 draw. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you managed to shut them out. Exactly. I mean, not entirely. It was 2 yeah. 2, but yeah. 10 men. And to, to, get, to get the result against them over in the new Camp. I know. Was there then? therefore it was fate it yeah. was Chelsea's time yeah. and yeah. there was a belief there in the team yeah I think that night once we went past Barcelona we were like you know guys we think we can do this now we think we can actually do this now and thanks to Mr. Reliable Mr. John Terry you know <laughs> <laughs> we had to play the whole of that game with 10 men we're like okay why will you do that <laughs> we've had John in the studio and that's a fact Mikel and, and it's interesting oh, I would love to get your insight on this and we we took we took the mick out of him when he was here as well because of course in 2012 yeah. he had the full kit on <laughs> He lifts the Champions League trophy. He's not part of it because he's suspended. Did you guys have a laugh and a giggle with him? We did. We were like, what were you doing on the pitch? What are you doing? <laughs> he had the full gear, shin pants, everything on. <laughs> if, you, if you had been in his shoes and yeah. you were suspended for the final, would you have done the full kit as well? Honest no, I think I would have just done the shirt. Not okay. the short. <laughs> and the shin pads. Oh, the no, that, no, that was really, that was really hilarious. We're like, what are you doing? Why are you wearing the full set? It's like, guys, you know me. I wouldn't miss it. I wouldn't miss it for anything. I was like, I was with you guys the whole 90 minutes, 120 minutes. I was kicking every ball. I was jumping. I was screaming. Yeah, we can understand. Is that, that. what made him such a great player? Because he's he's even post football, you can see he's just all in on everything yeah. that he does. All in, all in. I mean, what an amazing guy. I I, I was so lucky to have spent so many years with him. Uh, when you talk about a leader, when you talk about a captain for a football team, you you don't have to look any far. This guy will fight for you. He will die for you. He will support you. Uh, once you see him in front of you before a game, you know, okay, we're going to war. That's what that's what he meant to us then. Uh, once we had JT in front of us, it was a war. And that's why we were so successful. You know, if you have a bad game, you go into the dressing room in the second half, he pulls you by the neck and uh, wakes you up. What are you doing? Get your act together. Uh, and that's know, the things thing. Like that. I look at the, the football now, Mikel, and, and there's a lot of kind of accusations that a lot of football teams are a bit soft. I yeah, looked at that yeah. Chelsea team. Peter Cech, oh. John Terry, Carvalho, SEN, Drogba, yeah, yeah. Balak. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that's Proper the one. winners. Proper. Guys, the, if your standards are dropping on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday in training, you're going to know about it. You're going to get it. You're going to get it definitely, especially in training as well. You will get it. I mean, I never knew how training meant to these guys until I joined Chelsea. They, the way they play in games is the way they train. There's tackles flying in, there's fights in training ground, there's people like proper boxing in training ground because everybody wants to yeah. be on the start at 11 and come the weekend. And there is no place for you to like be like, okay, I don't want to train today. I don't want to. The only player I saw that did that and got away with it was Eden Hazard. <laughs> You've said that. <laughs> and John Terry said well, the he same. just never really trained. Oh, he never trained. The worst, worst. the most laziest <laughs> pass <laughs> football I've ever seen in my life. But then he would produce it. But then come the weekend, he produces it. He wins the man of the match. And then he are comes you, in and he comes in with the trophies like, come on, guys, you see? <laughs> are you surprised that it didn't pan out for him in the way that everyone, everyone expected at Real Madrid? I actually think when you look at him now, he's lost a little weight. Yeah. yeah. But when he was at Chelsea, the night before game, after dinner, he sits there. For like 20 minutes after, he's eating rice pudding and <laughs> <laughs> he, he likes his food. He likes his food. But then he goes to bed, wakes up in the morning, and on a Saturday, then he comes 3 p.m., you know, he's there. Producer. Producers. So the, the, managers, the, the, the managers just had to we overlook just, yeah, the fact we he just didn't let train. Him. We just let him do whatever he, he wants. In himself. training, he stands, on the, he stands there. The training starts. He stands in one place, in one position. He's like, can you pass me the ball? We're like, no, we're not passing you the ball because we, we've been running the whole yeah. 20, 30. It's like, okay, fine. Don't pass me the ball. All right, I'm here. And then he goes in after training and just mocks about comes the weekend and just produces the goods. And the opposite of that, John, uh, Mikel, and I'm not, I'm not putting words in your mouth here, we've had Harry Redknapp in that seat and Harry, of course, the, the, the uncle of Frank Lampard. Yeah. He talks about that man's training and work ethic. He said he's seen nothing like it. He remembers the days of Frank being a young boy at West Ham. He'd look out the, the window at the training ground at Upton Park and he'd see that guy working his absolute tail off to be the best in terms of training his lamps right up there oh uh, for me the best ever i've seen training best ever training this guy will finish training he's out there shooting and shooting and shooting and when you look at it it's not like he's doing something different every day he's shooting same way same technique he wants to shoot in a game and he runs he does short runs he just trains he's a machine He's a machine. And he did that for, I was with him for 12, 12 years. He did that consistently. Every season. Every season, he's raising the bar. Every season, he's raising the bar. But I mean, knowing Frank, he loves to enjoy his life. Goes a few beers. And once you see him in the, you know, the weather is hot. It's like 29 <laughs> degrees, 30 degrees. And he's got his winter jacket on on the pitch running. We know he's had a few beers yeah, now. Yeah. <laughs> Just, just on that, training sessions have, have kind of, they've become more, I would say, into the mainstream media in the way that managers conduct them. Obviously, yeah. there was a lot of speculation. There was, you know, you hear whisperings, players aren't happy with so-and-so's training sessions. Yeah. That has become a, a regular story because there's so much news circulating yeah. around football now. Yeah. Of the managers, I think there were six that you worked under uh, in, in Chelsea, uh, for Chelsea. Twelve. Twelve managers in total. I think about eleven or twelve. Yeah. yeah, and you won with five different individuals. Yeah, right. Ah, uh, right. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, there's lots of them. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot of them. Who conducted the best training sessions for you? A tough one. I will say the ones the one we players definitely did enjoy was, was Carlo Angelotti. John again said the same. Carlo Angelotti, perfect training. Players enjoyed working with him. Training comes in training. We play little five a side games. We do little show runs, and then we play like uh, ten v ten games. And players love playing this. Uh, you don't want to come into training and start doing all the boring things and, and things like that. You know what I mean? You want to come in, enjoy it, spend two hours, two and a half hours, three hours, go back home, you know, with the family and enjoy. It. But Carlo was was the man, and for me, he was the best band management. I've ever had at Chelsea. Why? What did he do that the other managers did not? Oh, the way he speaks to the players, the way he was, he was so calm. He speaks to the players. You can never see him raise his voice towards the players. He passes his message across in a different way. If you're not playing well, you're out of the team. Yeah. You know, but other managers, they will scream at you, they will shout at you like Mourinho. Mourinho is a total different animal. I mean, <laughs> Mourinho, we know once we, you know, when you come into the dressing room in the second half and you're not doing well, he goes to the toilet. Were you scared of him when you first joined? Oh, yeah, I was scared of him. Uh, <laughs> Maureen, I was definitely scared of him. Still I mean, now. 
<laughs> I mean, this guy is, yeah, the things he did to players. But it's just a way of him passing his message across, trying to get the best out of the players. I remember what he did to Mo Salah and, and, and the guy was crying in the dressing room in the second half. What happened? Crying. What happened? I think he was having a bad terrible, game. Yeah, bad game. And then obviously Mourinho came in and ripped into him. Massively ripped into him. I had and to then, keep changing the subject, but <laughs> did, when, Mo, when Mo Salah was at Ch- Chelsea, yeah. did you have any idea how, how great he'd be- gone to become? No, no. I mean, He's in tears, for goodness sake. Yeah, he was in tears. Yeah, yeah, professional. And then what happened? He didn't let him back into the, sec- uh, into the pitch in the second half. He took him off. Mo Salah. So it would have been oh. easy to do that and just get him off and say, oh, you're not playing well. Okay, off you go. Sit down. You're not going back onto the pitch, but he ripped into him and then got him off. <laughs> and Mo was in the change room in tears. Yeah, yeah. And now look at him. Look at him now. Look at him. Because the other one, and again, a lot of people forget this, Kevin De Bruyne. Ah, oh, exactly. Was Same in one. the Chelsea squad. When I watch Kevin De Bruyne play now, it's like magic. Magic. Absolutely magic. Could you see it though? I, with Kevin. He was a winger at Chelsea, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah he was a winger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, was a winger. I, because Kevin was always, he was always a stroppy guy. You know, he was always on his own. He was always moody. He was always grumpy. You could never get anything out of him. <laughs> but now when I watch yeah. him play, oh, what a joy. What a joy to watch. So what a joy. Is it fair to say what happened to them at Chelsea was the making of them in many ways? I think ways? so. When I, look back, when, when I look at it, you can also sort of say with Lukaku as well. You know, yeah. he went to Inter Milan, but he came back. Now it didn't work out. But when I look at the likes of Kevin De Bruyne and Mo Salah, what they've become I know. now best players in the world it's 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 amazing it's amazing to see they've become physically stronger they've become faster i don't know what happened to them i really don't know but i wish i wish chelsea let me go <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, no. carlo angelotti for you of all the chelsea managers you played under was the man and we were just saying off air no surprise to see that he's had success and longevity wherever he's gone and and the players are always upset to see him yeah. go which is not something you can say for every manager is it exactly yeah i mean for me like you said perfect guy perfect manager perfect man management knows how to talk to the players knows how knows how to galvanize the team and make the team believe that they could win uh, i think that's something that Carlo knows how to do really well i think when when he left chelsea as well we were all very very sad i remember yeah. that night uh, I remember JT, you know, shedding a few tears and things like that, and Lampard as well, because he is such a great guy, and we all love him, really. Which manager, and you can be honest with this because they're not listening, yeah. Mikel, <laughs> which manager did you struggle with at Chelsea? Who Ooh. did you just think, you know what, me and him, we're just not clicking? Conte. Antonio. Antonio Conte. As soon as he came, I, I knew that was it. That was the end. But I also, I was... That was the last stage of my career. I, that was when I left. Uh, I think he just came in. And um, the problem was he wanted me. I wanted to go to the under-23 Olympics game for my country in Nigeria. And he was like, you know what? You're not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you better, yeah, yeah. He was like, you better choose. So it was between me and Victor Moses. So both of us were invited to the national team. And then, um, and then he said, you guys are not going. Because if you guys go, you're not going to be in the team. I was like, okay, really? Okay, fine. And then Victor Moses said, okay, he's not going to go, blah, blah, blah. And then he stayed back. And I was like, you know what? I went to him and I spoke to him gently. I was like, listen, this is a national team. I've not played in the Olympics before. And this is my last chance of playing the Olympics. He's like, no, you can't go, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, you know what? Um, I'm off. I'm off. You know what I mean? I need to go. I need to go. (laughs) Did you already sense at that point that your time at Chelsea was running to an end? Yeah, yeah. I already sensed then because he brought in N'Golo Kante. And uh, and that was when I was like, you know what? I have no chance here. (laughs) N'Golo. How good did you see him? Chelsea have had a lot of great players in your position, haven't they? (laughs) They Including yourself, obviously. Yeah, yeah, they have. But it's been a great position for Chelsea, that that defensive midfielder role. Yeah, it has. It's always been a great and important position for Chelsea. And when you look at back, when you look now as well for the team, the way the team plays, we always have somebody there. I think Jorginho is doing a great job there. But for me, I always prefer N'Golo Kante playing that position. Oh yeah, uh, what a guy! What a guy! And with the churn of managers, this is another thing we asked John Terry. Uh, with the churn of managers, Chelsea were able to be successful, as as yeah. we've just said. You, you won everything there is to win with multiple different managers, and no other club that I can think of. Maybe Real Madrid during some certain phases of there, but they've always operated in a certain kind of style where the club is always the biggest entity. Mm-hmm. Whereas Chelsea, when Mourinho came in, he had this personality where he was almost bigger than the club when mm-hmm. he first arrived. He mm-hmm. had this very big personality. And Chelsea continued to be successful throughout that period of all that different ch- managerial churn. What was it like when, was it was there just gossip about when there was 
papers writing things about managers who were looking like they were going to get sacked? Did you sense when a manager was going to get the sack? And then was there a lot of gossip coming in with yeah. this new manager yeah. and all oh, who's he going to prefer, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. <laughs> what was it like being part of that dressing room well, with so th- much turbulence? <laughs> well, one thing was we always had a meet. We always had a meeting with Roman. Obviously, once the team is not doing well, he comes in and then he has a chat with us and then he sits down and everybody sits and they start. He has this guy, you, his friend who sits with him. He's the interpreter. And then he starts screaming at Russian. He starts shouting and screaming in Russian. And then, <laughs> and then the guy interprets in English. And then he starts screaming and then goes off. It's like, okay, you know what? You guys go back now and play football and start winning. And if we're not doing that, the next time he comes in, he flies in with his helicopter and comes to the training ground. And that's it. We know the manager's gone. Okay, so it's a two once, time, yeah. two strikes and you're out. Two strikes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so once he flies in with his helicopter, you knew the manager is gone. Right. Yeah. That, that was the death was knell it. for every manager, the sight because, of the helicopter. Uh, yeah. oh, oh, yeah, there's the helicopter, the manager's <laughs> gone. Roberto Di Matteo's the interesting one for oh, me, yeah. Mikel, because if people forget this, and we were talking about it today, not only did you win the Champions League in 20, you won the FA Cup, he did yeah. the double. He did the double, yeah. As a caretaker boss. Yeah, yeah. What does that say about the strength of character of the players? Because John also talked about that. There was a real unity you guys, I said it earlier, proper men, right? You yeah. guys kind of ruled the roost yourselves. Proper men, that's what that, that's, that's you call it. it. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. And when you look at when you look when you look back now, when you look now at the football teams, the clubs, uh, the players, when you look at Chelsea, listen, they're doing well. But it's just what you said now, proper men. That's what we had then. You had the likes of Michael Balak, you had the likes of Shevchenko, DJ Drogba, uh, uh, Cavallo, John Terry, uh, Lance, Frank Lampard, Czech. Ashley Cole, Czech. The ego that was in that dressing room is off the roof. Yeah. <laughs> off the roof. Yeah. And every day there is an ego struggle. Who is the man? I mean, we just sit and just watch them go off and do their thing. So was the that, were there fights on the training ground every oh, day? Oh, oh, every day. Every I'm telling you, every single day there was an issue. There was always an issue between one player or the other. Brilliant. Yeah. It's great insight yeah. that. But that's but that's what made us winners though. That's what made us winners. That's why we won. We were winning. We but were they so didn't successful. Fester, clearly, because they were they were always resolved, I assume. Exactly. There was always resolved though. But it carried on. And it lingers needle. on. <coughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. It lingers on and it stays. It stays for a while. But that's what made us winners. And at the end of the day, JT is the guy who comes in, steps in, and sort things out. You can't like every member no. of your team. But once you step past that white line, you have to go and play together and win for the team. And that's why we were very, very successful. One, one fellow we've not mentioned, and I loved this guy, uh, when, when he played alongside yourself, I'm hoping you, you know where I'm going with this, I remember seeing him score an incredible goal against Arsenal at the bridge. Michael S. Oh. How good was he? He never, get, he never gets the mention. He never gets the credit he that doesn't. he deserves. Like, we've been talking Scored a now, goal, exactly. great goal against Barca, didn't oh, he? Yeah. I mean, we've been talking for the past, what, minute? Half an hour. <clears throat> We haven't mentioned him. What a player he was. He is a guy that we call him the trainer, the training ground. He is a powerful machine, this guy. I mean, the way he trains as well. Every day he's there working, working, working. And what a human being. Apart from the playing football, what a gentleman he is. And like we say, he is the train. He is the bison, and that's what we call him. The bison. <laughs> yeah. Right. That's what he was right then. Public service announcement. I've got a massive apology to make because I thought I was being smart. I did my due yeah. diligence today. You confused me <laughs> earlier. And I did say to Robbie earlier, I don't think John will be Mikhail. It goes by John anymore. And I've been had, so I have, by Google. So I'm going to have words with Google. I've been calling him Mikhail all night. It's John. You just yeah. go by simple John. So my apologies for He's that. He's too polite mate. to correct you on air, Chris. It's all right, mate. It is John O.B. Mikel, a legend, of course, a man that needs no introduction. 11 years at Chelsea Football Club. Went on to spend time in China, in Turkey, back in England as well with Middlesbrough. Loved your time in Middlesbrough, didn't you, John? It was, yeah. 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 I loved the weather as well, didn't I? <laughs> I want to get back to, to all things, if I can, kind of Chelsea and, and memories, because I look through what you won in your career. You won everything. African Cup of Nations, for goodness sake, in 2013. Mm. I, I worked out the managers that you've won things with. Jose Mourinho, first time around FA Cup, League Cup. Mm-hmm. Goose Heading, mm-hmm. FA Cup in 2009. <laughs> Carlo Angelotti, the League Cup double in 2010. Mm. Roberto Di Matteo, FA Cup and Champions League double in 2012. Rafa Benitez, Europa League in 2013. And then, of course, Jose came back. And you win the Premier League in the League Cup. Rafa Benitez, 
it's fair to say, John, that JT had an awful lot to say about Rafa. He was not his biggest fan. <laughs> he was. He's an interesting character, isn't he? It's fair to say, John, isn't he? Well, you're a fan. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> was Let anyone? Be fan. <laughs> Literally. Let him be fan. <laughs> I, I mean, obviously, I, one of the most disliked managers yeah, by yeah. players. Must be. Must be. I mean, his man management skills. Not oh, great. man management skill is awful, yeah. awful, awful. Really. I mean, this guy never. You can never get anything out of him. He never talks to you. He never communicates. He never tells you why you're not playing. He never. <laughs> he, he, like the likes of JT. I mean, oh, he can, yeah. You know, he can bring them out of the, the team. team, but you need to explain to the captain why he's not playing. He is the captain. But then Rafa just goes off and just. <laughs> Blanks everybody and just walks as if nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> I, it, because for us, it's a massive thing that JT is not on the pitch. He's the captain, you know yeah. what I mean? He needs to well, know why J he's not playing. JT told us that, that that kind of he felt that Rafa being there was almost spelling the end of his Chelsea career. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, when Jose came back, Jose went up to him and said, "You're my captain." Yeah. yeah. And it was all kind of back into the fold. But yeah. he thought, well, if Rafa stays then, uh, you know, my Chelsea career could be over. I think that's why JT got him out. Yeah. <laughs> and he said that. He said when Josie called him up and said, where are you, JT? He said, I'm in Portugal. Right, pop your, pop your pasta down. You're my man again. And he actually said that story. He said when Josie called really? him, he said to Tony, his wife, he said, and he was out doing doggies, getting ready to be yeah. fit again because yeah. Josie yeah. said, you're still my yeah. man. Yeah. And I, that just yeah. lit the fires again. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you, you may, when, when, I mean, when Rafa was there, you could see, you could see John Terry was, wasn't enjoying his football. He was, his head was down. He wasn't enjoying his football. He, you know, he comes to train. He wasn't happy. You know, we're thinking, you know, what's happening here? You know, and then uh, I think for us as well, it was, we were very happy to see Rafa go, to be well, honest, when really. Someone like Rafa is not a great communicator, evidently. Yeah. Yeah. How is he in a half-time team talk? <laughs> not great. Not great. <laughs> really? <laughs> really not great. Really? You still don't get anything out of him. This is a he's, guy... the, he's the only manager that doesn't give the team uh, two hours or an hour before the game. We have to come into the dressing room about 20 minutes before the game and then he gives the lineup. But why? What? Yeah. Like every other manager I've worked with, like two hours before the game, you know you're playing. But Rafa, he gives it, he brings out his team about 20, 20 minutes. 15 minutes before the start of the game. Wow. So nobody knows what's happening. That's insane. Too. Yeah, yeah. That's, now, yeah, I've that's got to let you into a little secret, John. You know where I'm going with this. I am a massive fan of Manchester United. <laughs> okay, now you are a big fan of you playing the game at 11 years at Chelsea. I would have been an even bigger fan had you gone through with that move. I remember. By the way, I was reading this on Wikipedia earlier and yeah. I thought, I can't, I don't, I need him to explain what on earth happened here. Because I remember it. It's four paragraphs long. No, I'm a, I'm a geek. It should be more than that. It should be. I'm a geek, John. I admit it. Really? I remember when they were signing you and I got excited. I was a, this yeah. kid. I'd read a lot about yeah. you. Yeah. Under 17 FIFA yeah. World Cup. Yeah. Man United, I've got this boy. 21 <laughs> on the shirt. I'm excited. No, he wants to go to Chelsea. No! Why does he want to go to Chelsea? What on earth happened? Oh, wow. Where to start? What a long story. What a long story. I mean, yeah, like you said... Obviously, I signed the contract, pre-contract with United, obviously. Um, but before that, I was living in Norway. The Lin, thing, yeah. yeah, the thing was, yeah, Lin Oslo, exactly. I was playing for Lin Oslo. And Chelsea actually sent me to Lin Oslo. And nobody knew this, obviously. I, I don't know if I can repeat this on, you know, on air, but yeah. yeah There's a few things that was going on, you know. I, and, and I was there and Chelsea were looking after me, looking after my family, you know, giving me bits here and there, blah, blah, blah. And... And they were paying my school fees also in Norway because I was there, I was schooling and I was playing. And then obviously I had my trials before I went to Chelsea with Manchester United and Ferguson loved me. And all the players, they loved me. Roy Keane was my biggest fan. He was like, Gaffa, you need to send, you need to sign this kid. Keane was saying that. You need to sign this kid. And he was like my protector in training. If I get tackles from the likes of Paul Scholes, Nicky Bolt. And <laughs> Keane was yeah, in. Keane goes in and <laughs> yeah. So he was like my guy. And then obviously they, they heard that I've gone to Chelsea and Chelsea took me to Norway. And then Fergie was like, oh, wow, is that what happened? And then he flew to Norway and then he came with a contract and said, here, he's got, here you go, sign this pre-contract. You have to sign it. What is he, what is he just going to give you? Is there more money? Do you want more money? I'm going to give you more money. Just sign this contract. Sir Alex Ferguson. Yeah. You were, you were how old at this point, John? I was like 17. You got Fergie. Fergie, wow. yeah. Looking wow. from Manchester to, 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 to Norway. 
So of course you would never say no. Oh, exactly. That's why I couldn't say no. <laughs> okay, no problem. No problem. <laughs> so obviously I signed the contract and then the whole thing went yeah. viral. One on TV and then Chelsea were like, Wow, what was that? What's going on here? You know, we've took you know, we took this kid to Norway and we're paying a little bit here and yeah. there for him. And what's happened? Because and, we, because they were waiting for me to turn 18 to sign for Chelsea because obviously you can't sign until until you became 18 yeah. from, when you're from Africa. And that was what happened. And then once I got to 17, I signed a pre-contract with United. And oh. then, yeah, I became 18 and then the whole thing started. Chelsea came, kidnapped me from Norway. <laughs> and then, yeah, the whole long story. Yeah, for like... No regrets, though. Yeah, no regrets. But that, that is one of the most outrageous signing stories it is. of any player yeah. ever. <laughs> I think two players have said no to Fergie. I think it was... It's Paul me. Gascoigne. Is it Paul Gascoigne Paul well? Gascoigne said yeah. no to him. Yeah. And Shearer. And Alan Shearer. Alan Shearer. Three yeah. of and you. Yeah. And you. And, and I do wonder this, and be honest here, did Fergie blank you for years, John? Oh, he did. Did he? He did. First time we played against him, is it the charity? Sh no, I think it was the FA Cup or something. We FA won. FA Cup, you won yeah, the first we won. Wembley 2007. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we won the tunnel, he walked out, and I was walking out of the tunnel, so I stumbled. I saw him and I, I got so scared, so I stumbled up the stairs, <laughs> almost fell down. I was like, okay, you. <laughs> so he never spoke to me since then. Every time he saw me, he never said a word. He blanked to me. you. He blanked me. Ah. Oh. What about Blank Roy Keane? Did any of the United players say, oh, John, it's a shame you didn't? Uh, not really. I think Rio, Rio kind of did. Rio kind of like reached out. Like, oh, why? Yeah, but yeah. No, no regret. I mean, no you regret. love Chelsea. No, Chelsea no regret. Legend. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say one bit that I regret signing for Chelsea at all. I mean, I had I had an amazing time, won lots of trophies, made amazing friends, and yeah. Because when I think back to it, you signed for Chelsea in 06. Yeah. Right? Man United in Africa in 06, the biggest team, yeah. bar none. Yeah. Chelsea back then, they were still in their early mm -hmm. cycle. They're mm -hmm. huge now. We know that with the swathe of African players that they've signed over the last 15 years. Chelsea are a massive club. But I look back at then, that was a brave decision from you in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I know Chelsea were supporting you heading up to Norway. Mm -hmm. But to turn down Man United exactly. as a young boy from Nigeria, where that club is huge. Huge, yeah. Huge. Huge, yeah. I mean, no, no, that tells you a yeah, lot exactly. about Yeah, exactly. I mean, even when you look at that time, it was Manchester United and Arsenal. Yes. Because Kanu was still playing for Arsenal. So because of Kanu, I don't know if he was still playing then. Or he, he played for Arsenal, yeah. Just so, on to Portsmouth yeah, after exactly. So right a there. lot of the Nigerian fans were supporting either Manchester United or Arsenal. Chelsea, like you said, were in that in that mix. And then, like they all say today, because I signed for Ch Chelsea, yeah. that's why we have massive, massive Chelsea fan base right now in Nigeria. And that shift, obviously, with the likes of Michael Essien, me, Didier Drogba, Solomon Kalu. Chelsea uh, Koulibaly now. now. Koulibaly, exactly. Mendy. Mendy, it's huge. I mean, the, the club is huge in Africa. It's unbelievable. Do you remember your first start for Chelsea? I got a red card. <laughs> I got yes. sent off. You did. I think it was Reading, wasn't it? I think it was at Reading, yeah. I got sent off. I think it was uh, after 20 minutes or 30 minutes. I got sent off. And what did you say? I got, say? oh, smashed me. <laughs> Absolutely destroyed me. Absolutely destroyed me. This Were you feeling me. under pressure at that point? Yeah, I did. I did. I didn't play for... He didn't put me on the pitch for the next... Two, three months? You didn't trust him? No, no, I didn't trust me. No, I didn't, it didn't put that me That can't have been easy for, for you because you're trying to settle exactly, in a new club. Exactly, and... exactly. That's Jose. That's how it works. And he was like, that's it. You're not playing anymore. I was out. I was out. Okay, forgive me if I'm wrong here, John. I, I do think I am a bit of a nerd. I seem to recall when you were breaking, when you were a young boy, you actually played further up the pitch, didn't you? You played yeah. almost as a 10. Yeah. Because yeah. you were rangy. Yeah. You were yeah. Yaya yeah, Toure-esque. You exactly. could yeah, strike like past. That. Yeah. And then your move to Chelsea, you slowly shifted back. Was there a bit of a running battle there? Or was <laughs> Jose the boss? So it therefore? was Jose. It was really Jose the boss. It's like, you know what? I know you play like a number 10 in the national team and, you know, in Lino's law, you're very good on the ball. You don't give the ball away. You're very strong physically. You're very strong. But I don't see you playing up the pitch. I think you can take over from Claude Makalele because also Claude Makalele was also leaving then. It was this last season and I was just coming in. I was a young boy. I was like, stay here, sit down and watch this man play. I want you to be the next Makalele. So he's going to leave. I want you to step in and take his vice position. And he's and a legend like, yeah. of the club. Oh, what a, player. Odd. what a player. He's at the club now. Loads yeah, manager yeah, with yeah, Carlo Cudicini. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can I ask, the Africa Cup of Nations in 2013, did that, was that com comparable? Was it even, did it supersede the Champions League win to do it with your country? 
I put them both right up there. Yeah. Like I always say, I always put them both right up there. And it's a massive, massive thing to win with your national team. It's a massive, and it's very, very difficult. I don't think the likes of drug bars. I don't think he did. He did. No, I don't no, think he didn't. He did. Uh, well. Judge Wade didn't as well. There's lots of African players who didn't win anything with the national team. It's so difficult. And coming also from where we are, and you know the football there, with the politics and everything, it can be very, very difficult. And to be able to do it in 2013 was, for me, like I always say, I always put them both there together with the Champions League. People might not be aware of this. You won the Europa League in 2013. You won yep. the Africa Cup of Nations. You finished second in yeah. the African Footballer of the Year behind Yaya Toure. I got robbed, mate. I, I was going to say I that. I got robbed. You did, right? I did. I did. Really. I really did get robbed. Because when you when, before I went there, I was told that I won it. Before I went, I was told that I won it. You were flown there I thinking. was flying. Yeah, but the thing is, again, I was flying. I was on I was on the airport. And they thought he won't come yeah. if we tell him that we didn't get second. <laughs> yeah, but something else had happened there. I was on the airport flying to Nigeria because... Because the ceremony was in Nigeria. And Man City was playing. Guess what happened? Yaya scored. Uh, Yaya scored Banged in two goals. Two. Was it hat trick or two? I think two. it was two. And, and that's then. it. That swung it. One game. <laughs> A whole <laughs> season of blood, sweat and tears from <laughs> John Obi so. Mikel. It's so. I've, won the, I've won the, the Nations Cup. I've won the Champions League the year before that. And I won the oh. Europa League. There is no way I wouldn't have won it. I knew. I knew. I've won it. Was that the first season City won the league? 20, no, 2011 no, that was. It, uh, 2012 was when Aguero scored. The Aguero! It was 2012. Right, yeah. So 2013, right. Yaya was a big player. But oh, to yeah. win, United won it 2013, again, remember, didn't they? If you win it, if you win your, your continental tournament, yeah. in the case of Africa Cup of Nations, that ga should that guarantee you. It gives you that. It gives you that. It doesn't matter how much how many goals he scored. No. Because you I'm, won it. I won that, and I won the Europa League. And the year before that, I won the Champions League. league. Man of the match so, in the final. Exactly, man of the match. And I was... In my prime, playing lots of games at that period as well. So you couldn't say I wasn't playing. Yeah, that's a joke. And yeah, but yeah, you could have seen the ceremony. Before it was announced, everybody left the, the, the stage. People left. Because they were up in arms. Of course. They, knew. Was they yeah. knew. What okay. about coaching? Does that interest you at all? Uh, you, you, know, got, you know, when you finish no. playing, <laughs> that, uh. when you finish playing, <laughs> every player thinks when you finish playing, we can all be a top, top manager. Hmm. It doesn't work out that way, really. Because, you know, we all look at the likes of Pep Guardiola, club, and now Mikel Arteta is doing really well. Graham Potter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Got to say that, John. Still selling him. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think, yeah, there was that, always that assumption that if you had a certain profile as a player, it would be automatic to go into management. But it's a totally different mm. skill set. Yeah. I mean, yeah, okay. The manager, if you can read the game and play the game at the highest level, that, that's going to help a lot. Yeah. But when you're talking about, as you mentioned, man management, communication, organisation, uh, learning how to let people down gently, learning how to the right things to say. Yeah. As a footballer, you don't get any training in that. No, you don't. So, so it, it's, mm. it is a complete, you're right. Like, exactly. The ones that, that, that actually make it are a tiny, tiny percentage, presumably. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you, look at, when, you, when you look at Pep Guardiola, I think even when he was playing, you could tell that this guy... Because I watched a few clips of him when he was still playing for Barcelona. You could tell when he was playing, he was trying to organize. General. Yeah, exactly. He was the general trying to organize. I didn't know if club played football, but you could tell that Pep knew exactly what to mm. do. And he wanted to be a, a manager after playing. Uh, so, I mean, it is difficult. It is difficult. I thought between John Terry and Frank Lampard, JT was going to be the next manager. Yeah. yeah. We but, I right. mean, because Frank was such a quiet guy. You know, he comes to the dressing room, he sits on his own, he doesn't really speak to anyone. JT, he <laughs> likes golf too much. Is yeah. what it is, John. Listen, John, we're out of time this evening uh, and we could spend another five hours talking all things the beautiful game. The door is always open for you. You've moved to Dubai. I know you've got two young girls, but if you ever need to get away from them, <laughs> pop in and join us. It's been great to have you in. Thank and you so Rift much. Rift Trust yeah, is thanks, the uh, brand that, of course, yeah. you're now representing. Rift Trust, yeah. We'll get, of course, a check out John's uh, social media, his Instagram for more information on his brand, ambassadorial role for Rift Trust. Dubai Eye, 103.8. Join the conversation.